expecting Lisa, um, but you ended up with me. Um, my name is David. I'm, uh, I'm indeed um, head coach of Team Netherlands for this year for WSCC. Um, and I'm also uh, myself a debater. Um, I've been in uh, student debating for quite some time now, for quite some years. Um, so um, hopefully uh, by now I know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, I think uh, probably given that it's, uh, it's only an hour, we should probably right away get into the workshop. Um, oh, okay, yeah, could you allow me to share my screen because I have some slides. Um, in the meantime, I'll explain to you what I'll talk about today. So um, Lisa asked me uh, if I could talk to you guys about motion contextualization. Um, and um, I, um, let's see here. Can you uh, can you all see my uh, see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Ah, great. I'm just trying to organize it in a way that I can see you guys still. Yeah, there we are. Um, so um, yeah, no, to talk about motion contextualization, um, I um, dug up an old workshop that I gave on framing, and I made a few slight adjustments to it. Um, but overall, I think framing and contextualization are slightly different words for largely the same thing. Um, so therefore, just keep that in mind uh, when I go through um, through the workshop. And just in general, um, if you have any questions or anything, um, just uh, unmute yourself and just start talking. Or if you have ideas or other thoughts or something, it's probably best if it's um, if it's a bit uh, interactive. Um, the entire workshop. Um, so yeah, framing and uh, contextualization. Um, and what I actually want to start with is asking all of you, um, who can tell me what framing is? Is there anyone, is, let me ask one question, question before, who, who here, well, I can't see your faces, um, but who here knows what framing is? Maybe you can, uh, I don't know, um, turn on your cameras if you have the opportunity. I don't know if that's an option. No, otherwise, uh, yeah, there I see uh, if one more face. Yeah, well, um, I'll give the word. To, I, I can't actually see your name, um, but the girl with the headphones. Uh, I would say it's basically the way you describe, the way you present a certain issue so that um, you would gain understanding support from your audience so that they would actually know what you're talking about. They would be inclined towards your site in a way. It's sure, something I, that's used in debates and elsewhere, not just in debates. Absolutely. Also in marketing, in you know <laughs> different sure. political debates. Yeah, no, I think I think that's largely actually um right. Um I think overall sort of there you can say a lot of different things. Um and ultimately, the thing that matters a lot isn't just what you say or what point you make, but also how you make that point, which means both on one side, the words that you use to describe that, but also the parts of that thing that you like to highlight. And in order to illustrate that, um, I wanted to just show a few, uh, a few slides that I made. So let's say there's a motion about intervention, right? About military intervention and um, you see this image. What is the thing that pops into your mind? Anyone who uh, wants to have a go at it? I would suggest just unmute yourself and start talking. G go ahead, you can, uh, yeah. Am I audible? Perfectly. Okay, so basically I think that um, you would basically just think of Middle Eastern situations like um, US within Afghanistan, et cetera. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and this picture specifically, like um, sort of how does it make you feel about intervention? Um, well, it gives quite a negative connotation to it because um, first of all, it isn't very organized and it's, um, people, a lot of people probably associated with um, terrorist groups, et cetera. So yeah, it doesn't give a very positive image of it. Sure, that, that's one way to look at it. I mean, for me, myself, um, and I don't know if any, other, any of 
anyone else here feels um, sort of about that. But if you think about like, for example, should the US go into, uh, into Iraq or Afghanistan or uh, Syria or any of those places, and you see a picture like this, it seems like, okay, there's a lot of bad people there, right? It is definitely um, sort of not a picture that makes you feel sort of super good about um, potentially the people that are there. And that might stress for some people the necessity at the moment you see this picture, like, okay, it's really necessary that something is done about this, right? So highlighting this side, for me at least, um, drives me a bit more towards, okay, intervention is something that might be necessary sometimes. Then if I go to the next slide, what, what does this picture make you feel like? Anyone else uh, wants to have a shot? It shows the downsides of the intervention. Right. It shows it. It gives you a different picture of what an intervention is, right? Like so far, there's not really been much more information added, right? We have a question. Okay, should the U.S., for example, intervene in in a certain conflict? And just seeing this picture makes you feel suddenly a whole lot different about that question than seeing this picture, right? And I think that's a key thing about framing, right? Is that sort of the literally where you put the frame and like what you look at when you're looking at a certain issue and at a certain context changes the way you feel about that without actually hearing any arguments or getting any any kind of other information. Let's, let's do another one. Let's say there's a question, should, should there be a referenda um, in a country just on big uh, sort of democratic issues? What does this picture make you feel like? Anyone uh, wants to have a go? Sure, Olivia. Um, yeah, it's very, very pro-government, the government for the people rather than, um, rather than like uh, an anti-establishment feeling which would involve against the government, et cetera. Right, so in, in general, am I correct in, in sort of understanding from you that what you're saying is this makes you feel that the government is not so great and there needs to be government control, right? Or not? Was that not what you meant? No, kind of the opposite, like the government is here for the people. All right. Um, yeah, no, I mean, um, I, I, I'm having, I have to say a little bit of trouble exactly hearing what you're saying. I don't know if that's just me or everyone else too. Um, but if you could say it a little bit louder. Olivia? Yeah, sorry. Um, it's basically just um, a very pro-government feeling, like the government is here to help the people um yeah it's also just kind of attacks like um the elite feeling towards the government sort of um it's basically the opposite of a lot of anti-establishment um feeling that people feel so it's basically um a parallel of that right anyone else um anyone else who wants to uh share their view if they agree with this or or differ on this um it kind of shows like how the government is actually controlled maybe by the big companies or uh, those who make a lot of money and are very influential in the country more so or so they actually control the referenda more so than the actual population so um, kind of a feelings of the, the government is corrupted and stuff like that yeah no, for sure. I, I think I think those those views together. I think they're super. Um, they're 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 super right. And I think before you go into the question of does this mean a referendum is a good idea or a bad idea, right? Just this picture in itself makes you feel okay. The government isn't so nice, right? And the government not being so nice. If you see this picture and you think about that, okay, the government isn't so nice. That might be swing you more into sort of okay maybe there should be at least some level of democratic control, right? And then you can argue, okay, referenda, maybe they're good, right? If the government is a bad actor, 
or not such a great actor, that might swing you more towards, okay, referenda, they might be a good idea, right? If I then show you this picture, what do you feel like? Where, where does this push you on the question of are referenda a good or a bad idea? Anyone? Uh, I'd say it presents a referendum as an opportunity for like citizens to share their opinion. So it really represents the power of like um, the world of each citizen. Sure, sure. That's one way to look at it. Anyone who has a differing view? No, everyone. I would, also, I would also say it's this group thing. <laughs> so one person shouting, everybody follow. Right. It, it doesn't necessarily seem like the most nuanced, rational decision yeah. making or something, right? I mean, there's not a single person who would oppose. So it's. Yeah. Yeah. Makes, no. me, makes me think how much it's really their opinion. <laughs> right. No, exactly. I, I fully agree with this. Right. And I mean, there are obviously different ways. I mean, it's only a picture um, and it's only there to, to illustrate what we're doing here. But I think overall, sort of my connotation too with this is on the left, I'm like, okay, the government is pretty bad. And I see the picture on the right and I'm like, okay, the people are pretty bad too, or sort of vulnerable for groupthink or populist leaders. And they're all just shouting and angry, but they might not actually be able to make the best decisions. So overall, that picture, right, steers me again more towards the idea of, okay, maybe referenda are necessarily the best idea, right? And ultimately, it doesn't matter because there's, with these pictures, there's not a right and a wrong answer of the way to look at them and to interpret them. And sort of, there's not, a, in general, sort of, um, it's, it's not about that, right? But what I'm trying to illustrate with this is that the way in which you contextualize, right, a certain issue, by either highlighting, okay, the government is really bad versus highlighting, look, this is why the people are very bad and in general making decisions. It's the same with, look, this is why there's such a high need for intervention because there are many very bad people operating in different countries versus intervention has mostly sort of led to great abuse by, by intervening countries or whatever. Highlighting those different parts of the context swings you in a different direction when you see a certain motion without you actually necessarily making an argument yet, right? Because you're not saying, look, this is why in, in, in Syria or something, an intervention now would be a good or a bad idea, but it's just in general sort of highlighting why there are certain, sort of what that context is, right? That there are bad people and that there must be something done about that that already sets up a hugely favorable ground for you as a proposition in order to propose intervention. So overall, the key is the image that you have in your head has a massive effect on sort of the way that you look at a certain, um, at a certain debate. So yeah, what is framing then? Um, framing is basically control and contextualization is the same thing. It is control over the context of the debate. Um, one way to sort of describe that in a different way is you play around with deeper underlying assumptions or truths basically within a debate. So let me give an example. Let's say you have a motion on um, a regulation of certain corporations, right? Whether that regulation is gonna have a net positive or a net negative outcome or something, is something that is obviously up for debate and you're gonna to have to give arguments. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and that is always obviously gonna be how a debate goes. However, whether people from the beginning onwards believe, look, corporations are terrible actors, right? That only go for profit and uh, sort of they've done this and this in, very, in, in many countries around the world versus, for example, another side saying, um, look, corporations actually overall, there are obviously bad things that are happening sometimes, but overall they are hugely important. They add a lot of value and they do a lot of good, right? That underlying assumption 
is very important for how that debate plays out. And obviously it doesn't necessarily yet tell you whether this is a good idea or not, this specific regulation on this specific corporation or this specific subset of corporations, but that underlying assumption of corporations are usually good or corporations are usually bad matters a whole lot for how the rest of that debate is going to go. So therefore, what you do with framing is basically you try to proactively decide what that underlying assumption is in the debate. What a, a certain actor looks like, what a certain conflict look like, uh, what corporations look like or whatever, because throughout the rest of your arguments throughout the debate, it is gonna be helpful at the moment you have already set up in the beginning, sort of an assumption that in general pushes judges more towards your side of the motion and makes all your arguments more belie uh, believable later on. So that is also why this is such a sort of key thing to do in debating and to actively use, sort of to actively look at a motion and begin a debate and uh, a sort of start off in your prime minister or your LO speech with going over the different parts in the motion, the context in which it plays, the different actors that play in that motion, and sort of give a favorable interpretation of sort of what they look like and what steers their decisions. Because even if you spend three minutes or so or four minutes even in your PM going over those different things, that's a lot of time. But throughout the remaining 20 minutes uh, or 24 even, 24 minutes you have, it is going to be so helpful at the moment you've done that early on in the beginning. So therefore, framing is basically controlling those underlying assumptions. Now, like I said, right, it affects, it, it affects everything, right? So the first thing that it can affect is possible argumentation. So therefore, framing can be useful specifically for case building. For example, at the moment you... Um, you um, uh, set up uh, sort of that, that, that framework of, um, let, let me give an example actually that I have this motion, right? I'll, I'll go more into, into this later, but let's, let's say you have this motion, right? Developing countries should privatize their state-owned enterprises, right? Does everyone understand what that means? Yeah, that's clear for everyone. So for example, like very often, probably a motion like this is gonna be about energy, right? Very often oil, because many countries own their own oil industries. But overall sort of this house is that, yeah, developing countries should privatize their state-owned enterprises, right? This is definitely like a type of motion where um, with the framework that can ma make a massive difference on what this debate looks like. For example, one of the key questions of context that is very important for this debate is are these companies, these state-owned enterprises, generally enterprises that make money or are they enterprises that cost money to operate, however, um, are very important for a country? For example, you can say, look, at the moment you run a train company that doesn't necessarily make you a whole lot of money but it is very important because you want transport in your country and overall that leads to more economic development. You can also say, look, oil companies or airlines or something, you can make a lot of, lot of money, right? Running those. So for your possible argumentation, the case that you can run and the case that you choose is very dependent on whether you think these are money-making operations or money-losing operations. Because what you can say at the moment you look at the motion is that let's say your prop, right? Should they privatize their state-owned enterprises? You can say in general, um, there are many private companies that might want to run these operations and that could, um, could do them very successfully, right? At the moment you say, okay, uh, this is a, a, a um, sort of a, um, a money-making operation, right? At the moment you say it's a money-losing operation, you could say, look, um, we can still give a few subsidies or whatever for companies in order to run this stuff. But overall, currently as a state, we're losing a lot of money trying to run this stuff. And these countries could reinvest that money in other operations such as healthcare or other more important things that they're doing in their country, right? Which one of the two is true and which case you choose 
is very dependent on whether you say these enterprises are money making generally or money losing. And it's the same from up, right? Because from up, you can say either, look, these are in general money making enterprises. Therefore, it is very important for the state to keep them because this is a massive source of income for many of these developing countries. At the moment you look at, for example, oil companies, or at the moment you look at airlines, like an Ethiopian air or something like that, that is massively important for the income of a certain country, right? So there, at the moment you say these are money making operations and highlighting that, you can make a very strong op case, right? Saying, look, these countries should keep these industries because ultimately it's one of their most important sources of revenue. On the other hand, you can also say these are generally not making money making operations, which is why if you leave it to the free market, they will not be done properly, right? Because people will only build railways for some super rich urban areas or something in which people can, can, can at least pay some money for it, but you will never build a train uh, and a railway in, in the majority of your country because it is not a money-making operation. It doesn't make you any money. You're not going to get profit from it. So therefore, the state needs to do this because the state does have incentives, and then you have to explain what those incentives are in order to actually sort of make sure that the, the rest of the country gets connected. But overall, sort of... Excuse me, one question, one question. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, the things that you are describing, isn't that already part of the argumentation? So I think- Like when you say that, when you say that it's like, um, it makes money and things like that, that is, I think, isn't that already like uh, a part of an argument? Um, so if you don't highlight this individually, sort of in your framework and in the way you're setting up the debate, it needs to be right? Because it becomes part of an argument that you might still run. The key here is, is that depending on which answer you choose to that question, and you can choose both, different arguments become possible for you, right? Because the you make money as a state question uh, uh, argument doesn't become a, a sort of a possibility anymore. At the moment you say, look, these, these uh, uh, enterprises are hugely money losing, and uh, sort of wouldn't be done properly by the free market because there are no incentives for the free market in order to actually do this, right? So at that point, it is a deeper question that you need to answer before you pick your arguments on what do we want to sort of shape, uh, 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 sort of portray these, uh, uh, these enterprises as. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing, right? And I'll, 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 I'll um, highlight a few other things that are relevant to your question because it's a good question. I'll, I'll highlight a few other things in a bit. Um, but overall, that's why the first thing, possible argumentation is very dependent on the way you set up a debate, right? On the way you, you, you pick the context, the countries that you say uh, the motion is about and the debate is about is gonna have a huge effect on which arguments are viable and aren't viable in your own, in your own um, uh, sort of uh, in, in the debate. And that is not just your own possible argumentation, but also the argumentation of the other team, right? Because at the moment you give a certain context, let's say you have a debate um, just in general about, um, um, well, it, it can be about almost anything. Let's say it's about um, privatize or, or not privatization, but just in general, free trade and protectionism. Right, so should countries have tariffs, right? Basically taxes on import and export of goods and services, right? When you say this debate is mostly gonna affect countries in the developing world, or this debate is mostly gonna affect this motion, this thing is mostly gonna affect rich countries because here are many reasons why countries in the developing world aren't so much affected, they might not, sort of trade a whole lot internationally or something or not be so reliant on that, right? Versus some rich countries. And you can also say it the other way around, right? The answer that you give to that makes a massive difference in what kind of arguments are gonna play a role in that debate, both for yourself and also for the other side. So therefore possible argumentation is gonna be hugely affected by the way you contextualize the debate and sort of set up uh, sort of the, 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 the context of that debate. 
The second thing is basically the believability of different argumentation. So here, basically, um, it is, I guess, an, an extension of the first thing that I said, right? The first thing is which arguments do I pick? But also it just becomes which arguments also on the other side become believable and more believable or less believable within the debate, right? Because it might be that certain things in general, for example, let's say you, you have the privatization thing again, and you gave a very, very sort of good description on why corporations are usually very, very bad actors when you're opposing privatization, right? Um, Op can still come up and say, look, or, or the prop then, I guess, the side that's in favor of privatization can still come up and say, look, here's a reason why companies have certain benefits, right? They might be able to attract more capital easily, easily right? They might be more specialized. Uh, they uh, might uh, have bigger incentives to improve because of competition or because of profit incentives or anything like that, whereas the government doesn't really have any of such things, right? You might highlight those different things. However, that argument, even though it's true and it is still possible in the debate, given that you've already done a lot of work preemptively explaining and painting a picture why corporations are usually very bad actors, that argument just becomes a lot less believable in this debate. So you've already basically preemptively set up, right, an, an explanation of what corporations are, what they generally do, that just makes the other argument less believable. And they are gonna have to basically clash with your frame uh, and explain why your frame isn't true before they can even run their own argument, right? So therefore also the believability of different arguments gets massively affected by, um, uh, by um, uh, the context in which the debate plays. The same at the moment you look at sort of specifically developing countries, right? Are these governments in general very good sort of uh, as governments that are very good, right? Are, are, are the people there skilled and do they know stuff? Do they have the time and, and sort of uh, ability to uh, run different companies well? Um, are they corrupt or not? All those different aspects of those governments are gonna play a massive role later on in the debate when you try to make an argument that it is very good if the government runs this stuff because they might be able to benefit the people because the underlying assumption and the underlying picture of sort of um, uh, what a government is uh, and what those governments li uh, look like and what they do um, sort of is gonna have a massive effect on, um, uh, on whether people believe that argument that you're making or not. And the third one is the weighing of different argumentation, right? The weighing just, of different, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. have a question. Um, so what if a uh, prop comes up with like a certain frame and the side of opposition disagrees with the frame and puts uh, like a different frame um, to the debate? Uh, I'm like a third speaker and I feel like it's really difficult then to like conceptualize the debate because it's like the, both things are just like playing in different countries and different fields when like stuff like that happens. So I'm just wondering like how then to to interact better in that kind of debate uh, well, if that happens? For sure, that's, <laughs> a, that's a very good question and that definitely can happen. Um, I think in general, what you want to do here is you want to defend your frame and I'll get onto this a little bit later on, but when you set up a frame and opposition comes up with a, a, a counter frame, basically, what you need to do is you need to give reasons why your frame is more believable and better than the frame that the other side is giving. Because very often what you see happening is that people, and I'll, I'll get onto this a little bit later, um, but what you see very often is that people, they come into a debate and they say, this is the frame, sort of this is the context of this debate. They don't really give a whole lot of reasons and reasoning and almost you could say argumentation on why that frame is the correct frame for the debate, but they just claim it. And then you get another team coming up and they kind of do the same thing. And at that point you get chaos, right? And it becomes kind of up to the judges, which one they believe or something. And both teams say, no, look, it plays here. No, look, it plays here. What you basically need to do is when you design a frame and I'll, again, I'll get, get more 
into this later, but when you set up a frame, um, you need to um, make sure that um, you give good reasoning and explanation and argumentation on why that frame is the right frame and why it is true and why it is the best frame and not other frames uh, sort of are, are also possible. So you need to do a lot of work in order to make your frame actually believable. That also means that if someone else comes up and presents a different frame, they can only do that at the moment they interact with your reasoning, your argumentation on why your frame is true. They need to basically rebut right, your argumentation on why your frame is the correct frame. At that point, you're, you're going to get what some people call a meta debate. But basically, if they do this, the best approach is to then again come in and defend your frame. So give better reasoning or better sort of more reasons why your frame is the correct frame, attack their reasons that they're giving why their frame is the correct frame, rather than just sort of letting them make their frame and you make, their, you make your frame and then kind of just go on and do the rest of the debate. So overall, make sure that you engage with sort of that, that you have two things. One, you have your own reasons that you have prepared well and thought about why your frame is the right frame frame. And second of all, make sure that if they set up a competing frame, you give active rebuttal to their explanation on why their frame is actually the correct one. Does that make it a little bit clearer? Yes, um, that makes more sense because in debates where I, when this happened, um, both teams just kind of ignored each other and just like playing their own field. And that was definitely chaos. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I see that happen uh, all the time for sure. Um, so definitely just engage with their frame, defend your frame, it's very important. I'll, I'll get to that later. But yeah, overall, sort of the possible argumentation, the believability of different arguments, uh, the weighing of different argumentation, right? I was getting into that, but that one is also pretty obvious, right? Changes, how much do I care about a certain argument and about a certain impact, changes depending on how that impact sort of is, is contextualized and framed and how this debate in general is framed, right? Like if you have, for example, a motion where um, uh, it is one of the traditional frameworks that you see coming back time and time again, where basically it's about a political system, right? And it is about a certain change to a political system. It doesn't matter what that change is. Overall, what many teams do is from the beginning onwards, they say, look, there are certain people in a country that are now having all the power and there are certain people and there are very big victims of this, right? They have no representation in the current sort of political system. They have no money, uh, sort of they're disenfranchised. They're often discriminated or whatever. Those people are the most important people in this debate and the rest of this debate should serve. The debate should be, should be judged on who is the best for these people. Right? At the moment you set, set up that frame from the beginning onwards, from your PM onwards, and then you have different arguments on why you help those people. And another team stands up and they don't engage with this, they don't explain it, but they just say, look, rich people are going to lose money, um, or, or not even rich people, but just sort of the average person is going to lose a bit of money, and we think that sucks. That is not going to win from you because you have already from the beginning onwards explained why the group that you're talking about is the most important group in this debate. And you've given, given reasons. And if, it's, if, if you've done it well, you've given reasons on why they are more important than the other groups in the debate, which means in order for them to get weigh their sort of to, to make their impacts and be able to weigh them against your impacts, they need to engage with their framework, right? So therefore also the weighing of different argumentation becomes different at the moment you um, already in the, from the beginning onwards give a very clear contextualization of this, these are the groups or the people or the country or, or, or whatever the situations that this debate is about. And this is the most important thing for that. Does it make sense for everyone? Yeah, I, I saw a hand, I think it was Olivia. Is the hand still there or has it been answered? Um, yeah, how does this apply? Like in certain debates, you have a very, very sensitive topic. How can you frame that so that it doesn't lose the debate? For example, um, political correctness. 
So you said a, a sensitive topic, is that what you said? Uh, oh, sorry, did you say a sensitive topic? Yeah. Yeah, so I think if you look at political correctness, this is sort of one of the debates in which this is actually used a whole lot, right? Because first off, at the moment, let's say you're in favor of political correctness, right? You think political correctness is good. Why do you think it's good? Because sort of you have an underlying framing that you push throughout that debate that these that there are certain people that suffer a lot in their daily life constantly from sort of people offending them or microaggressions or kind of being discriminatory towards them or something. Given that that is the state of our society, right? It is most important for these people that this problem gets resolved, right? Under that framework, political correctness may be good, right? You can also say from the other side, from the beginning onwards, just giving a random example, look, for most of these people, there are any people and they are victims, right? And they, they, they are discriminated or whatever. Political correctness and the way someone addresses them is not what that's about but it is about other things. It is about not being able to get a job, right? It is about not uh, sort of uh, 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 being able to get uh, a good education. Uh, it's about not sort of being able to have access to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, the, the opportunities that you need in order to improve your life. Honestly, for many of these people, they don't care about the way they are addressed or something as much. They care much more about those other things. So therefore, this debate shouldn't be decided on that minimal impact of are people now going to talk to you in a slightly different voice or a slightly different tone or, or, or use a different word to talk about you. The question is, how are these people in their actual material opportunities that they have in their life going to be affected, right? And then you can make an, and, and then when you set that up, you pave the road for different argumentation because then you can say, and that, that's a, a, again on, on sort of the possible argumentation, given this frame, I'm going to explain why actually the culture of uh, sort of uh, political correctness has led to, I don't know, more sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, backlash or whatever by other groups in that political system which has made it harder for these people in order to actually achieve good sort of outcomes. Uh, and the only benefit that they've gotten from it is that maybe society is a little bit more political, politically correct, but we would have rather had those other things, right? You could also say, look, there's a zero sum game, right? All the focus that you're now pushing on political correctness, you could otherwise push on different things, right? On, on, by focusing on, on, on different uh, uh, goals that you want to achieve as a movement or whatever, and the push on political correctness distracts from those things. So even if you get it, it doesn't weigh up to the alternative thing that you could have gotten at the moment you wouldn't have pushed for this. Uh, and there are many other things, but in general sort of whether you illustrate political correctness as a very important, the most important thing to the lives of these people versus you say it is not at all an important thing for the lives of these people is gonna have a huge effect on which arguments and which points in the debate are gonna matter the most. Does it make sense? Good. So, so definitely sort of, you can use context and framing not just in extremes, right? You don't have to say either minorities good or minorities bad, right? Because yeah, I agree probably sort of on sensitive topics, it's not the best idea to say, look, we just think minor minorities are bad and sort of people should be mean to them or something. That's probably not, not the best framework to pick. However, also on the nuances in more sort of what things matter for them, what is the situation in which, in which they currently find themselves uh, uh, and, and what are the barriers that are holding them back right? There are still a lot of room for framing and contextualization. So that's uh, probably the, 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 the most complete answer. Um, I have one note here, which I think is worth highlighting. Note that a frame always exists in a debate because it is the same as if, if you look at these pictures, let's say sort of, I say to you intervention, you're always going to have an image in your head, right? 
And people are always going to think about that thing in a certain way. So there is, it is impossible to have a debate in which there is so, sort of no contextualization or no image or something in the head of a judge. There's always going to exist one. Given that there always exists one, it is better to try and make that thing as favorable towards you as possible. So I would almost say sort of, and that is about the necessity of framing and contextualization. Um, there is no way sort of to exclude this factor from debating. It is always going to be there. So therefore, it is best to try and uh, exert as much control over that thing as possible. So I'll go now into a little bit more concrete things of how, how to actually sort of play around with this. So I think you've you got two main models, in, uh, two, two main levers in general. The first one is your model. And the second one is just the context of the situation in which that model operates. So note that for the model, um, sort of the way you set up your model is gonna have a massive effect on all these different things I'm talking about, right? The possible orientation, the believability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for example, going back to the, this house is that developing countries should privatize state-owned enterprises, right? From prop, and, and, and let, let's say we now don't do the whole developing countries part of it. Let's, let's push that aside for a second, but just in general privatization, right? Of state-owned enterprises. And let's say even more specifically, privatization of healthcare, let's say, or, or privatization of, 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 of for example, uh, the police force. I don't know. It works for all of these, right? The way that you do this is probably already a tool that you have in order to benefit yourself. For example, one of the main arguments that is very often made against privatization of state-owned enterprises is that many of these, and that's also again a contextualization thing that is very important in this debate, um, is that many of these uh, uh, enterprises are natural monopolies. For example, healthcare or railway or anything like that. Very often you, you don't have many different railway companies competing with each other, right? Because they basically, uh, it is, uh, there are industries that cost a lot to develop in which uh, sort of often one is already enough uh, so, for example, if there's one railroad with a train on it, you don't need literally next to it, next to it another one. Uh, it is often one with massive sort of benefits of skill. So if you can offer train service around the entire country or, 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 or anything like that, uh, very often uh, uh, sort of you can compete much more easy than at the moment sort of it is very expensive uh, to actually uh, 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 then at the moment you only offer one of them. Um, so, so therefore, I think overall, sort of very often an op will come, in, come into a debate and say, look, the government needs to do this stuff because otherwise you're going to get monopolies like a train or whatever. And that train company is just going to raise prices sky high and they're going to offer poor services because there is no competition, right? And for a free market to function, very often competition is one of the key things that is probably necessary for that, right? So therefore you already know okay, from prop, we might have a problem, right? We might have an issue at the moment we privatize because you, we can't just claim there's going to be competition and benefits. And therefore, how are we going to explain that these companies have the right incentives, right? You can play around with that in your model. For example, in many states where you have a, a kind of privatized state enterprises, they do it through government contracts. So you get, for example, contract for a few years to offer services. And then every few years, you basically have an auction where different companies can make a pitch of like, we can now offer the train services. Uh, and then they get basically the railroads and everything. We, we can offer it and we can sort of, uh, uh, they make a pitch on why they can do it better than other, uh, uh, than, than other companies uh, have done in the past. It, it would be the same with, for example, the police force, right? So you have, you have basically get a contract where you as a company for a few years, get to um, basically supply the police force and do that kind of stuff. And you get paid a certain amount, you make certain negotiations. And then after a few years, you get uh, a new auction. And then if it wasn't done correctly, that means you will lose the contract, right? And different companies can jump in and there's still some level of competition, right? That is a model that you see very often used in sort of privatization debates. And also just in general is in the real world, 
a model which is very often used for privatization of sort of more fundamental state uh, uh, activities. Uh, because that way sort of you prevent that problem of a company just completely messing up but there basically being no control system no accountability mechanism or something for that um so that could be a model that you pick right government contracts um from the op you can also say uh right you can also often do like kind of a counter model right where you're saying look uh what we support is isn't necessarily um saying okay um uh we're uh in a certain industry or business like let's say healthcare we're the only healthcare that people can get but just say look we're at, we have state healthcare however we allow private healthcare to exist on the side right so like you can still have privatized healthcare people that are offering this however the state is just doing this right uh, doing this too and offering hospitals all that kind of stuff which also means that if the government is really, really, really bad at doing this and offering a super poor service and high prices or anything like that, that means that probably you would get still get private uh, competitors that would be better and that people could use and that have an incentive to actually offer better healthcare or something. So you can say, look, under our side, and you don't have to, right? There are pros and cons for a model like this, but I think overall sort of, you can, with your model and the way that you sort of design that model, you can already determine a lot what this debate is going to play on, right? So therefore, I think um, um, sort of your model is definitely one of your key levers that's going to have an effect on which arguments are and aren't viable in this debate and which impacts are probably going to weigh heavier, uh, heaviest. The second one is just in general, your broad contextualization, right? So those are questions of where, who, how uh, well how is i guess the model i would say but where who what uh, uh sort of those type of questions are just in general part of the context so generally it is where does this debate play right what countries what do those countries look like right what matters for those countries what doesn't matter for those countries setting that up clearly in the beginning uh, uh sort of can can yield huge benefits later on for making your own case win uh it is the same with sort of uh who and not what countries and what do they look like, but who is affected by this motion, right? Who is this debate about? Uh, uh, who is this debate not about? What do those people look like? Why should you care more about one group or, or another group? That is the other, uh, uh, sort of, that's another thing you can do. Uh, but overall, sort of, that, that is what I mean with just general contextualization. Um, and for this, one main tip that I can also give to you is always read the motion very carefully like word for word and think with every word sort of you have to go through this exercise right do i want this thing to be relevant in the debate how do i want to explain this how do i want to sort of uh, uh, illustrate this thing uh, that this uh, sort of um uh, 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 that that this thing is about so like i don't know i didn't even think about this for this much but let's say right this house developing countries right all right, that's the first thing, the first term in, 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 the, in, in the motion, right? Probably you want to think a lot about what, what are these countries? What do they look like? How do I want to affect this, right? All right, privatization, right? Then you get more in the model of sort of, okay, what is privatization? What does it look like? You get the, all the question of the model, right? State-owned enterprises, again, sort of, are these money-making operations, right? Are these likely to be natural monopolies or not? Are these, um, um, in general, sort of, what type of businesses are they, right? What, what kind of markets are they often in? How much does that matter for the average person, or is it mostly elite interests? All those different questions, just from reading, like, literally every word in that motion, right? Carefully and thinking about that and trying to interpret that and playing around with that uh, means that you realize suddenly how much you can do with each different word and your explanation of each different word uh, uh, to, to kind of steer that debate in a different direction. Make sense for everyone? All right, good. So um, in definitely for the sake of time, I'll skip a few um, slides. Um, yeah, so um, what is needed? That's probably the, the, the most necessary uh, slide. Uh, pun intended, um, to, uh, to go over now. Um, so I think the first thing that is important, and this is just a thing, like I've been debating for a long time now, 
I've been debating for a long time. And in general, people just don't do it. They start their debate and they go in and they just start running their arguments and they leave all this stuff vague. And then the other team kind of does the same and you get kind of chaos going on in the debate or, or they just kind of say their thing, but then don't really explain or whatever. So the first thing that I want to stress towards you is when you are with your team and you see a motion, go over these different words. And most importantly, in your first speech, start with setting this whole thing up, right? Setting up this motion, setting up those words clearly. And if there's a word that you think is not relevant or not up for debate, you don't need to obviously go into that thing, right? At the moment you, you sort of have read this thing and you've come to the conclusion with your team that you're like, okay, developing countries, I don't wanna do a whole lot with that part or something because I wanna focus on other things. I wouldn't advise that for this motion, but let's say as a hypothetical, that would be your conclusion. You don't have to go, okay, let's go through the motion, developing countries. We think that means countries uh, that are often in the Southern hemisphere and that are often not so rich, moving on, because that doesn't do anything, right? That doesn't do anything for, for your side or something. So you have to do it tactically, right? I, when I say you need to do it, that means you need to sort of, and, and when I say you need to spend time on the different parts, you need to spend time on all the parts where you think here, if I give a certain favorable or not favorable interpretation of this thing, that is beneficial for my side. And you need to really in prep, go over this and in your first speech in the beginning, set all these different things up clearly because it is gonna benefit you throughout the entire bench. That is the first thing that is important. The second thing that I think is important is your framing needs to, to a degree, be intuitive, which means sort of, you can't necessarily, I'm just, turning on the lights a little. Um, you, you can't just set up a framework that is completely crazy um, because likely then it is not gonna sort of stick uh, or the judge is not gonna believe it, right? Because the key what you're trying to do is you're trying throughout the rest of the debate when that judge is thinking about intervention, you want him to think about that picture of these terrorists, right? And these bad guys, that's what you want, right? So if you, have a, if you have a picture that is so ridiculous that the judge isn't gonna believe it, then he's not gonna think of it, it's not gonna work, right? So it needs to be to some extent intuitive, which means for example, when you're talking about uh, developing countries, maybe if you're a very good uh, sort of analytic, uh, if you're very strong analytically, you can make an argument that developing countries uh, sort of that that governments from developing countries are um, um, really, really, really f sort of be the best governments in the world or whatever, right, are really fantastic. And here are many reasons because they have countries in which they sort of they are trained in dealing with the most difficult types of problems in their country, uh, right? They have a much harsher uh, sort of uh, task than anyone. Very often democratic control isn't super good, which means they've been there for a very long time and they've become very, very skilled. I don't know. Like you, you can think up uh, many different sort of rational arguments on why that might be true. But uh, ultimately the underlying point that you're trying to make of these are fantastic, fantastically functional sort of governments is something that just doesn't match with the intuition of most people. You don't have to say, look, these are terrible governments or something. However, the, the, the framework of, of these are the best governments or something is something that is likely very hard to believe for many judges. At that point, you just set up a very high bar for yourself. You're likely to, 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 to get the result that the judge just doesn't believe your framing. And at that point, it doesn't benefit you. So your framing needs to be intuitive. You can't go completely crazy. It is the same with, for example, a super crazy model. Right? A super crazy model very often is a bad idea because sort of it is going to mess up the debate and it's probably not going to benefit your side. So you want to be smart, right? You want to be as smart and you want to have effect on what this motion looks like, but you don't want to go off to crazy. You still want to be intuitive and you want to be able to defend it and actually sort of uh, get that judge to believe that picture. That's the second thing. The third thing that's very important is it needs to be clear. Um, it needs to be very clear 
what the thing is that you're actually pushing because very often what you get and and one of the things you, one of the things you need for this right is that you need to do it early on in your and in, in your first speech you want to start setting this stuff up because the problem is up often that sort of you don't do it first and then someone gives a different point that you think falls out of debate because it doesn't match your interpretation of the motion and then later on people start adjusting their frameworks or something a little bit it's not clear it's going to be chaos you're not going to get the benefits of your uh, uh of your frame so it needs to be clear which means you need to do it early on you need to take explicit time for uh sort of for this right um and you need to make sure that um uh um you um very clearly say what is and isn't part of this debate, right? Because note for framing, it is not just saying this is what the debate is about that is useful. It is also highlighting this isn't part of the debate, right? Illustrating what falls out of that debate and sort of just making it very clear sort of what thing or group or, 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 or subject or countries or whatever the debate is about. Making that very clear is um, uh, uh, is super important, and the reason is ultimately that at the moment the judge didn't fully get the takeaway or something. Many of the benefits fall because if at the moment you look back back at the slide with with all the different benefits, right? Let's say possible argumentation, right? You've gave, given a fantastic frame that basically makes a main argument that the other side would want to bring almost impossible, right? If you've done a great frame, that's what you've accomplished. However, if they still run that argument, right, and kind of ignore it, the question is, did the judge remember that frame, right? And does he realize that this argument falls out of the debate because of that frame? That is dependent on that frame being crystal clear, right? Being set up early on in the debate in a clear way dependent on a second and a third speaker reminding that judge of that frame right using that frame to respond to different speakers saying as my first speaker said this debate is about these groups of countries the reasons are such and such and therefore this argument falls out of the debate so pushing that frame clearly throughout the debate is very important for it to have any effect the last thing is like I said earlier on already um, in an answer to a question, right? And like I said, then sort of, oh, I'll talk about this a bit later. Well, now is later. You need to back up your frame, right? You need to almost treat it itself like an argument or something where you need to provide logic on why this is true. With a model, for example, you, you, you often have fiat, right? So you, you don't necessarily have to, you can just determine what the model is that you're going to implement. But already when you move beyond that model, that isn't true anymore, right? What are developing countries? Who are the groups that this debate is about? What do those people care about? All those things aren't things that you can just determine. You can't be like, oh, I'm prop, I get to choose. So therefore it's this, right? You need to back it up from the beginning onwards on why that frame is true. So therefore it is very important for you not to just say, because what I mostly say is, I, I would say C is 95% is they don't do it, right? Point one, do it. The other 5%, probably 4% out of that 5% is people claiming that the debate is about a certain group, but not doing a whole lot to actually back that up. But you need to, when you realize how important this framing is for the progression of the rest of the debate, sort of when, when, you, when, when you look at that, and hopefully that's one takeaway you've gotten from this workshop, um, but how, on how important this thing is, then you realize, okay, I need to actually do work and I need to do my best, uh, like my damn hardest best in order to make sure that this frame stands, which means you need analysis, right? Why is this frame true? Three short reasons. First, this is not that. Second, such as and such. Three, this is not that. Now, they might come up and say that this frame isn't true for this reason. However, that doesn't, that isn't correct because of such and such and such. Sort of in that way, going through it, like it's a part of your argument or like it's a thing that you're actually sort of uh, proving from the, uh, uh, yeah, like it's an argument. That is the way you need to approach a framework too. And if they say things that respond to this, you need to rebut those things and give sort of supplement that logic. So definitely sort of make sure that you develop the logic in order to to support the underlying 
uh, framework. I think uh, it's, it's, it's been an hour now, so I think this is a, a good um, point for me to stop, but um, is there anyone who has any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so um, we once had a debate where we were debating only about the framing almost through all the debate, uh, which is a problem because then all of the arguments fell out because the framing was so opposite and so different. How can you avoid that? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So I think the first thing um, that I want to say is um, it is not necessarily bad if a large part of the debate is about that framing. That is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, what is probably worse is for you not to engage with their completely different framing, uh, because at that point, sort of at the moment, they, they really believe their framing and they use it well. That might be bad for your, for your side. But I understand your point of like, ultimately, you, you don't want the situation where it becomes like a yes or no thing, right? So yes. on the one hand, what you want is you want to give better reasoning and engagement, kind of like you do at the moment, they give a different argument than you give a different argument on why your frame is better. So not just kind of claim it or claim, but this is true because this is the real world or something, but give actual sort of logical, deeper reasoning on why your frame is the correct one and why their frame is wrong. That is thing one that I want to stress. So therefore go into that meta debate Thing two that I want to stress is what you want to do. I think at some point, if they really sort of have an intuitive framework that they can back up relatively decently, is see where you can find middle ground, but still find middle ground that is slightly more favorable towards you. So be like, okay, some of the cases are going to be, are going to look like opposition is talking about. I concede that. We think, however, it is more on our side because of this reason. However, let's say it is roughly equal, right? Our impacts are much more important then because of these reasons than their impacts. So therefore sort of, we still win that debate. That is probably the solution out there. So sort of conceding a little, right? Saying they're, they might be, what they're saying might be true for these reasons, right? Be, be sort of uh, a compromising in a way but then only do that when you know that you can still defend your position right in that compromise so so don't just be like okay they're correct uh however uh you know um uh sort of still our arguments might work here i don't know or whatever but always come there with a convincing story so there might be some of that true there might also be some of ours true given this sort of this mix of these two cases why then do we still win or something that's how you especially as a third um speaker i want to approach this and as a second sometimes also already but i would definitely say in the first try to defend your framework almost 100 percent right keep pushing that if you notice okay this debate is not going to get out of this clash then go look for that middle ground in which you can still win make sense yes totally thank you yeah any other questions? All right. Uh, so, Rhea, are you uh, are you still here? Yes, I am. I am. All right. Good. So, I I, I think that's it then. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that workshop. I think it was very useful to all the students, and thank you to all the students for coming. And hopefully, we'll see you next week with Sharmila and feminism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye bye. You. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.